Hypermesh 2024.1 updates for composites modeling. And uh, we'll be looking at three main topics today. Uh, one covering some general workflow improvements, then focus on, on hyperalignment, and as the last bit here, also having a look at injection mode mapping, um, which is not so new, but we have an addition uh, to that. So first, the general workflow. Uh, there's two main changes and improvements to the workflow here. So the first one is uh, the sequence entity. And uh, when you think about building a laminate, especially uh, like thicker laminates, and chances are you have repeated laminates within uh, in those. And sometimes it's getting cumbersome to build uh, those kind of laminates. And especially if you want to go on, make changes to one of those uh, things that repeat later on, or you have common uh, common layups that you're using um, over and over, like a whatever very typical quasi isotropic, right? So like a minus 45, zero plus 45, 90 or something like that. And uh, then the sequence entity will help you a lot with, uh, with building your models. So what it does essentially, you create this list of layers with orientation, thickness and material. And then you can apply it within your laminates. And uh, that means the sequence itself doesn't have a, a shape yet, but you will assign the shape then to this set of layers when it's within the laminate. Uh, there's quite a few options and, and, and tweaks you can do here to make it most uh, kind of comfortable for your use case. So it's probably best if we have a short look in a live demo here. So let's start with this uh, quite simple model. So this one already has has a laminate. It has materials. Uh, it has a well property, as you can see. So we can basically already review the laminate. Now, if I was going to build something similar, I would basically just go on and uh, create apply from scratch. Give it uh, whatever thickness I desire, as well as orientation potentially. And material, and then I could say, okay, I, I need a number of uh, uh, duplicates for that. So I'll just go three duplicates here, and uh, do the very, very classic minus forty-five zero minus forty-five zero forty-five ninety in here. And then I could go and either uh, just create a sequence and drag it in. So now I got my sequence. I'm able to use that sequence within any laminate. So either I could create a new, new laminate in here and just drag the sequence in. And as you can see, it pops up here. If I make any changes to the layers, they immediately apply. So that's all very kind of straightforward and, and intuitive. Um, if I already know, I'm going to sequence uh, several times everywhere where I'm going to use that same sequence. I can basically go into, uh, uh, into an override here. So I could say I want to have this repeat like three times wherever it's used. And again, you see quite quickly it makes this uh, applies that to our sequence. Now, some other use cases that you can do. First of all, well, you can use it repeatedly uh, several times. I could use it, for example, and as a top and a bottom of a laminate here, and then, for example, just uh, reverse the sequence. So now, you know, if I wanted to go for some symmetry, then I have other uh, applies in between that are not necessarily symmetric. I could go about it like that, and you can see it immediately applies those uh, quite nicely. I can do individual repeats here as well, so I could, you know, again do the do the repeats change here. Um, but most importantly, I can also um, be quite flexible with the shapes. So in my case here, um, I have two different shapes in my model. So one is the, the full shape 
of uh, of this here, and then kind of the partial one, which is only the the left bit that we currently see. And uh, now, if I'm if I want to just apply one shape to the whole sequence, that's pretty straightforward as well. I can basically just grab one, and uh, it shows up straight away. And now we can see immediately how it applies here. Um, but I can also go and still put individual shapes on my plies. So when I put any uh, individual shape here, so I'll change that one to the full. Then now we can see, okay, things are um, assigned such that it uses the full shape. Let me pull that up a little bit more. And now even when I change this here, it will still be because it's really working as an as an override, right? So all those sequences that we have are basically instances of of the original one with their specific settings. Um, yeah, drag and drop. I've already shown within the lamnet. So I think that's a, a very quick uh, overview of what you can do. There's plenty of uh, of possibilities. Uh, you can also kind of detach, so kind of unlink the sequence plies if you really figure out at some point that you are not going to be using those with changes that you want to apply to the sequence, the sequence as well. So that's another possibility. Um, back to the slides. Um, the second uh, new thing is the syncing of the zones. So you might be aware of that when you work in the in the composite browser, normally you have your uh, kind of ply based view, right? So you see your landed, you see the ply lists, um, but you also have the option to actually move over to the zone view, which provides you then all the different uh, kind of zone equivalents that are derived from the current lambda that you have. And uh, originally, uh, they were always auto synced all the time. But if you really have big models, then uh, this starts to make uh, the uh, well the building a bit laggy. So for performance reasons, this makes much more sense, especially as there are like in the normal workflow as we've seen it, you don't require to see the zones all the time, right? So. Uh, Basically, when you look at the zones here, now you will see that there's a new indicator whether this zone, uh, this laminate is actually synced or not. And you can basically just hit the sync button and those laminates will be updated. In my case here, I have some plies in the laminate which don't have a shape assign, which is why it uh, returns kind of an empty, empty zone here. But the main purpose is really um, to speed up things for very uh, heavy laminates. And then when you want to do calculations, like uh, doing hyper analysis, or you realize the laminates, or you do an export, then obviously the syncing is done automatically in the background for you as well. So you don't have to remember actually to sync. It's only when you, for whatever reason, want to view um, the synced zones and their contents um, in the browser. That being said, let's move over to uh, to Hyperlamet. So uh, our built-in Hypermesh Composite Stress Toolbox. And uh, I did go back in time and I um, was trying to find an old slide, which finally I did, uh, which tells a little bit about the motivation, just to make this point clear once more, why are we, we even doing this? And it's mainly because even now, uh, after years and years of kind of composites, in various industries, um, this is how sort of many of the uh, users are used to do basic calculations with composites. So they have spreadsheets, um, they have in-house codes, um, they might have some dedicated software, and all of them, they sort of come with, with similar problems. And first one is, is integration, um, also in well, ease of use, maintenance, um, when people leave the company. So, you know, this just as a reminder why the whole toolbox is there in the first place. And uh, I'm sure many of you are aware what the 
uh, toolbox is capable of at the moment. So also this is just a short reminder that for all of the involved um, entities in the composites uh, modeling process, we do have various analyzes. Uh, we could do post-processing as well. Uh, we do cover a extensive list of, of failure criteria. And now um, with the latest version, we are actually also having a, a very simple, straightforward uh, plate analysis workflow. So it's essentially, once you have a laminate, you're good to go. So the standard case where someone just needs to figure out some properties uh, or what happens on a simple panel that's, uh, that's easily covered for um, some simple use cases at the moment. So really you start with the laminate, you hit the dialog once and you have access to define your parameters for the setup and immediately run and get your results for load response failure, buckling or natural frequency analysis. But this is though uh, meant for, for office struck profile. So here we have a, a, well, simplified wing, but it's really just meant as a starting point in our case, because we want to use this laminate, which is the one here on the bottom, to uh, basically create a simple panel, right? And this is here in the structural element section. So plate analysis is what it's called. And we could just go uh, put in some simple values, like really taking the length of 500 and uh, width of 100, for example. Maybe 50 elements is enough. And we can pick, uh, pick the lambda. Could it go for that? And, uh, and set some boundary conditions. So in this case, I want to keep A and C free. And you can basically see what uh, those boundary conditions correspond to. So at the moment, it's not custom here, but you, you immediately see how are those translated, basically. Then uh, D, I'd like to leave, leave clamped, and B will just make uh, a simple roller. And now we can, well, just do some simple simple uh, additions here in the loads. We can see, okay, and why uh, we give some compression if we put it uh, positive on A and negative on C. And uh, then maybe just some, some bending induced basically here by the load um, on the B side. We could put buckling modes or natural frequencies. Oh, maybe I'll just put here. Then you have to decide where you want to kind of have the working directory for this, because if you actually hit analyze, you will be running an obstruct uh, calculation in the background. And uh, obviously the results need to be saved somewhere as well. Uh, otherwise, you can just hit create model and you will get a new model on your new page. So this goes step by step. Um, first, it starts with copying the laminate, then it creates the geometry, um, creates your load cases, um, the output settings, and so on and so forth. And we can take a look at the model in a few seconds here. Basically, we see it already. So now, well, we could spot that there's already a result imported. We see that we have our linear static case. We have uh, some buckling results. Maybe we just start with some quantum work. As I mentioned, this is uh, kind of nothing, nothing too specific. Um, but by default, and you can obviously change that one if you just hit the create model button. By default, we have the composite strains and stresses on. And uh, so you can very quickly have access, you know, to all the all the results that sort of matter um, straight away. Also, we can take a look at the buckling results here. Uh, so, uh, buckling mode, for example. So that's really quite quite quick and neat because you don't have to worry about uh, all the all the basic settings and getting everything set up correctly. You can see we have the load collectors for the different uh, edges, um, the boundary conditions. So it's it's all very kind of straightforward and easy 
even if you've never um, touched Opdestruct uh, before. Now, continuing here um, on the hyperlimit side, we have uh, made the uh, result export here as an addition, um, which was previously only available basically when um, writing the full results to, to a file. And now this is uh, sort of much easier because wherever you are with your uh, with your layups. So oh, let's stay in this one. So wherever you are, if you just do your analysis, you have an export button here, which allows you to um, basically save um, save exactly what you see as a CSV in here. So if you customize it and you're only interested, for example, in the ply data and uh, uh, 2D matrices, then this is what you'll be getting in the export. Same is when you go to plot stuff. You basically just create a PNG from exactly the plot area. Um, so, you know, you can scale it first and then you just hit the export button and you're good to go. Um, alternatively, for some of the results, you can also just export the uh, underlying data. So all the data that you get for each degree, you can export that one also as numerical data in a CSV and create your own plots um, just the way you, you prefer them. Uh, another point here on the hyperlimit side is also the P-shell support for various analyses, which is uh, rather new as well, because um, well, normally, if you have P-shell, um, you are working most of the time, at least people are working with the uh, Mark IIs, right? And uh, <coughs> essentially, what we're doing is we are using those uh, matrices to compute just the same data as we would do for a normal uh, stack of plies. There are obviously some, some limitations. So when I do uh, an analysis here, we can see I have different elements selected in here. And the first one has an actual stack. Uh, the last one here as well. The one in the middle is my P shell, which is the equivalent P shell. And you realize, looking at the engineering constants, you don't see any change. Um, if you check the laminar matrices, you don't see an effective change here because those are effectively zero, right? So what you, you do spot is a kind of a numeric uh, phenomena, phenomenon there. But the important point here is that obviously uh, we can do load response analysis and we'll get to uh, some sensible strains, but if you're looking, you know, to figure out what is the stress distribution through the plies in the underlying uh, layout that the P shell originally has, well, obviously that's uh, not not doable. But still, this helps a lot um, in in cases where uh, people just have the P shell data available and still want to do some some basic analysis. And uh, the last point here is uh, the derived load case um, post-processing. There were a few limitations before, especially when you had uh, different uh, file types imported. Then uh, that, led, that led to problems. But in this case here, I've just created a simple derived load case. So this one here has four load cases, as you can see. There's one load case. We can actually try to create another derived load case in here. So uh, let's do that. I'm just going to pick uh, two of those, do a linear superposition of those two, and run it straight away. So I'll have my second derived load case here. And if I'm adjusting the analysis to, to use that load case, I'm ready to go. So now let's move to the divide flow cases. And well, besides that, it has all the same functionality as usually, obviously. So I can do that 
do the uh, sweep into whatever element I'm interested in and look at the detailed results. So just just an addition there. Now the final um, topic of today is the injection mode mapping. And here I'm not going to go um, into demo, but rather look at the overall workflow because I'm I'm feeling that the solution itself isn't uh, too widely known um, yet. So what the solution itself does is that we're basically covering various tools that go together for a successful um, simulation of injection molded parts. And the first bit is here on the multi-scale designer side to create the uh, material models. And second bit uh, could be obviously Inspire Mold, but also other tools that do a molding simulation. And then we put that together and do the actual mold mapping. And that's that's the bit um, that is covered in hypermesh in the injection mold mapping ribbon. And from there, with our newly mapped model, we are able to um, do the full structure and analysis, including also nonlinear and uh, progressive damage using multi scale designing in the background. Now, what's the new bit here? The new bit is actually the addition of cut mode support here, which means the normal process sort of looks like this you start with your molding simulation, assuming you have your uh, material data in MBS. So multi scale designer already, and then you're getting out a mode mesh and you're getting out fiber orientations. Then you start the, the mapping process. And uh, previously, well, there was a list, as you can see here, of supported formats and supported uh, solvers, so to say. And now cut mode with the CFX um, mesh data and also the fiber orientation data has been added. So no changes here to the actual process. It's uh, it's really an addition of the solver support mainly. And uh, that being said, I can only say thank you. Thank <laughs> you.